Hello, what is up, Rainy Day Writing Guild? My name is Jake. Happy Saturday. Uh, we got a little bit off course with our recording this week, um, but we should be back on schedule next week. So, uh, I will be continuing on the Hot Potato Story. This is part two, um, written in sort of my own genre. Uh, but I'm picking up where Joy left off uh, with her piece a couple days ago. So, let's begin. The engine murmured at idle as the girl went below, into the small cabin of my boat. What a strange kid, I thought. You'd better not let anything happen to this one, Vince. I throttled up and spun the steering wheel to point the bow away from the island. She said she wanted to go to the mainland, but the clouds were so dark that way. Storms a brewin', I called. Better grab an extra sweater or something. A few minutes later, I saw her come up wearing my favorite gray turtleneck. I must have frowned because she asked, Is something wrong? No, I shook my head. Just sit down and hold on tight. It's going to get choppy soon. Oh, was all she said. I watched as she buried her face in the cable knit collar. Several silent minutes crept by, marred only by the quickening wind and the slap of the fiberglass hull against the ocean waves. So, I said by way of making conversation, what was all that back there? I jerked my thumb over my shoulder toward the island. Oh, it was terrible, she started. Lenora, she was... Her voice trailed off like it hurt too much to finish her sentence, and she hugged her knees to her chest. After waiting a moment of silence, equal to the gravity of her tone of voice, I supplied, Friend of yours, then? The girl nodded her head. Sorry to hear that. What's your name? She seemed to consider me for a minute. Abigail, she said finally. Abigail, I repeated. My name is Vincent. I knew an Abby once. Can I call you Abby? She nodded again, slower this time. Okay, Abby. The storm is getting closer, so you're going to have to hold on tight. I watched as she looked for something to grip. You might even want to go back below and shut the door. I don't have any other rainwear but this. I patted the blaze orange slickers I wore every time I set foot on a boat. Never go to sea without them, not since that one time in the Navy. I shuddered at the thought and pulled the collar a little tighter around my neck. That's okay, she said coiling her fingers around the gunnel railing. I'll stay up here with you. I could use the company. Suit yourself. I shrugged and pushed the throttle a little higher. As a professional sailor, you learn a thing or two about the sea. You know when to push your luck and when to give the sea her due. I had begun to veer to starboard to avoid a particularly rough-looking patch of ocean. The thought brought me back to my old Navy days. I was what they call a tin can sailor, the ones who serve on destroyers. We were sailing in the South Pacific, warm tropical breeze kissing the sweat from our bare chests and backs as we strapping young men leaned on the side rails and imagined what voluptuous island girls might populate this island or that one. The vacation was cut short when the sonar man picked up something on his scope, something underwater, moving fast. The skipper and the XO thought it was an enemy sub, of course, so the ship gave chase. All of us went to battle stations. Helmets, flak jackets, life vests. Depth charges were ordered, and we dropped drum after drum, but never had the satisfaction of a hit. Sonar kept pinging it, but every time we thought we had a fix, the sound return showed it coming at us from another direction. It was maddening. We were up against a prototype submarine, maybe? or just a really wily enemy skipper, I heard the captain was at his wit's end. Day bled to dusk, dusk faded into night. We were still at general quarters, the engine still turning out battle speed, but every spotlight was ablaze. I imagine we looked a lot like a Christmas tree out there on the water. It was no surprise what happened next. The foreign sub had finally finished toying with us and moved in for the kill. We thought it had to be a secret weapon, some one-hit torpedo, because the blast came from nowhere. In a single shot it broke the keel in two, and the destroyer sank in a matter of minutes. 
Later I would learn that of the 300 men aboard, only 30 of us survived the sinking itself, and only 10 more would ultimately make it home. Despite being in the Tropic of Cancer in August, that night the water was cold. It was a clear night, new moon, and after all the oil fires burned out, we were swallowed by darkness. We weren't alone, however. Something was in the water with us, and I don't mean sharks. Whatever had sunk the ship was still lurking beneath us. We could feel it slip past our feet, between our legs, as we tried to tread water all night. One by one, my fellow shipmates disappeared almost soundlessly beneath the waves with little more than a quiet plop to bookend their young lives. In the pre-dawn hours, civilian fishing boats drew near. They seemed in no great hurry, going about their usual routines as if nothing was amiss. The last of us hollered and waved our arms, trying to get their attention. By then we had come to the conclusion that what had sunk the ship had taken our friends was not some newfangled enemy submarine, but an organic sea creature, or demon, whichever you like, and we shared one solitary thought, get out of the water. The fishing boats must have heard our cries, because they came closer, but their occupants seemed confused, as if they couldn't see us, though we were a mere stone's throw from their hulls. The fishermen then seemed to lose their nerve and turned around. With safety slipping away, we swam for all we were worth, chasing our salvation. When I clapped my hands on the wooden gunwale of the nearest little boat, the pilot recoiled in what could have been fear or surprise. I hauled myself into the boat and helped my comrades in after me. The fisherman did not speak, nor did he seem to understand English. He just made the sign of the cross a dozen times and motored us to shore as quick as his little Evanrude would push us. He was babbling some gibberish and gesturing back from whence we came. I glanced over my shoulder to see a huge dark mar on the water. I think at that time I wrote it off as an oil slick, but now that I am seeing the same dark blotch, I know it in my bones, it's back. The beast is back. How did you get here so fast? Abby asked out of the blue. What? I asked, still reeling from the memory. I don't even remember calling you. She was regarding me through slightly lidded eyes again. You don't? I feigned ignorance. No, I don't. She was getting obstinate. One minute I was in the mansion, trying to save the grandfather. It smelled like it was burning. The next I woke up on the pier, and you were waiting. Exactly, waiting for you to wake up. I didn't think she was buying it anymore. You called me on the radio. I held up the mic to the CB, mounted to the steering console, and waggled it at her. And why are we heading back to the island? She squawked and pointed beyond the bow. You see that shadow? I pointed in the direction we had been traveling. Too dangerous. I had to raise my voice to even hear myself over the rising wind, whipping at her clothes. I don't care. I can't go back there. She lunged for the CB mic and began screaming into it. Help! Help! I'm on a boat! I've been kidnapped! Her rapid motion sent the boat rolling side to side. Sit down, kid. You want to drown us both? I shoved her back. She fell into her seat, but never relinquished her grip on the handset. The coiled CB wire stretched taut, and then coiled up again as the radio itself followed. It was not as securely fastened as the wire was, and for good reason. It was a prop. Abby sat there with the cardboard fabrication in her lap, with a detailed picture of a radio printed on the hollow box, the kind you see in showroom stereo cabinets, you know, the ones with the tall glass doors. She looked up at me and our eyes met, hers an expression of loss and betrayal. I felt a grin tug at the corners of my mouth. You should have gone below, girl. I'm not getting in that water again. If that means you go back to the island so I can put solid earth beneath my feet, so be it. I turned my attention back to the bow and motored back toward the pier. So that was my entry for this uh, hot potato experiment. So hopefully Devin can come in and pick up where I left off, turn it into something that's her own. And uh, I'm very interested to see what she does and how Lydia then closes it out next week. So if you are as interested as I am, tune in again on Tuesday, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care now. Bye-bye.